I'm here today with Phil Ward from Stratton Acoustics, who has created this extraordinary Ellipsis 1512 loudspeaker. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you. Um, congratulations on building such a remarkable loudspeaker. I think. Well, thank you very much, but it's, I'm, it isn't just me, it's myself and Ben and Amy and Dave who are all involved in the project. Um, and we've all made a big contribution to, yeah. making, to making this happen. Right, so it wasn't... Whose idea, how did it get started? Or how uh, did it get off Dave, the ground? Dave Fowler, who's really the, the driving force behind the company and the head of the company, he came to me four years ago or right. so, and with this crazy idea, basically saying, I've, I've always been fascinated by old 1970s big studio monitors, like the JBLs and the Tannoys and the mm. Uris. What would happen if we combined that sort of philosophy with contemporary high-end audio drivers and manufacturing techniques? What kind of speaker would result? And I initially thought, well, this is mad. Um, but then it kind of sat with me and I thought, well, maybe there's something in this. What would happen if, if we looked mm. at doing that? I think I mentioned to you uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, when we installed the speakers that one of the reasons for the huge improvement in live sound quality at, at gigs and concerts is, sure. is driving yeah, the development. Yeah, and yeah the I was quite surprised that it's happened so recently that it, things have got better things have got in much the last better. decade. PA drivers are now very technologically advanced, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago or longer, they were quite primitive devices. Mm. They're now not, they're much more sophisticated. Mm. And that's what partly what we've taken advantage of is that, is that this, is, this is where public address and hi-fi kind of meet. Right, right, yeah, because I've never seen a, a domestic hi-fi loudspeaker with a 10-inch mid-range on 12 it. 12-inch. Tw sorry, 12-inch <laughs> mid-range on it before. Um, no, and, and when, when Dave proposed, let's do a domestic hi-fi speaker with a 12-inch mid-range unit, I said, nah, can't do that. Mm. But yeah. as we began to investigate the possibilities and, and look at some of the drive units that were available, it, it became clear that it, it was possible, mm. that you, you can do it. Mm. Um, and this is what we've ended up with. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, is the reason why you don't see them anymore, in fact, you hardly ever did see anything quite this big, did you, is because, is that because it makes the box too big for domestic services? Not partly that, um, but also, again, uh, if we're talking 10, 15, 20 years ago, those drive units weren't really that great. And they, they did sound very crunchy and hard and had no detail and were very coloured. That's right. kind of the problem with, with those old classic studio monitors. They were, they were very coloured. Sure, they right, had, right. They had all sorts of technical issues right. that, that don't really occur now if you select the drive units carefully. Mm. And yet they're still short throw with this sort of classic sort of corrugated mm -hmm. yeah. surround. The differences tend to be in the formulation of the pulse for the cones, but more significantly in the magnet systems. Yeah. So a lot of the um, finite element analysis of magnet structures that you see in high-end hi-fi drivers, that's now found in PA drivers. So the levels of the fundamental level, levels of distortion from the voice coil are very, very much lower than they used to be. Right. Why was it that uh, Dave came to you? What's your background? My background. Uh, is is the audio business since I left since I, I I'm an industrial designer by training I had a design degree and I joined Morden Short in 1981 right and I was there for till the late eighties and I moved out of audio into technical writing for a bit and then some people might remember that Canon had a go at oh, yeah. loudspeakers yeah that strange sort of yeah the, 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 show yeah, thing. the wide imaging stereo loudspeakers so I was design manager at Canon Audio for years. Crikey, as long crikey. As I, I didn't realise they were going for that long. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, when Canon pulled the plug on that, I went, I joined Name, was it Name for oh, five yeah, years as course. project manager and speaker designer. Which models were you involved with there? Uh, the NBL, but lots of, with, the NBL was the one I was known for there, but there was sort of continual, continual modification and management of right, the right. other products, the right. SBL, Intro, Credo, all of them really. So it was before they started using the um, NXT type yes, drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I did write the user manual for that. Though. <laughs> okay. 
Um, when I left name, I left name just after Julian died in 2001. Right. And I've been freelance, self-employed ever since, just right. Right. technical writing, consulting on speakers, designing, playing bass. What's Dave's background? Is he from he's, audio? No, no, he's a he's an entrepreneur, industrial designer. He's, he's okay. managed huge industrial design projects oh, and really? products. Right, right. But he's he's just an audio geek who's always wanted to do an audio product. Right. Well, he's finally followed his he's dream. He's finally followed his dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In this extraordinary beast. So, so, I mean, so Dave's responsible for all the industrial design and the okay. design for manufacturing. Right, right, yeah. All, all the um, extraordinary decisions you can't do that yes, <laughs> yes you can <laughs> and i believe it's based on a jbl the 4350 is an old jbl product yeah. from the 1970s that is a, has a similar sort of layout two 15s a 12 and a tweeter yeah that jbl had two tweeters but right um so that's that yeah that's of all the products that's the main inspiration behind it hmm. and and yet Presumably, it doesn't share anything. It doesn't share any characteristics of any sort of parts or. No, is the size no, the same. Uh, no, the JBL's a bit bigger. <laughs> is it really yeah. wider? I suppose. A bit wide, yeah. <laughs> is um, this? I measured this as a meter wide. I think it's about a meter wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is uh, this is big enough. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the ideas was that one of the justifications for the size was it's, a, it's that it's a piece of furniture. It's yeah, a, it's about yeah. the size of a big chest of drawers. Yeah. Yeah, good point. That's kind of what makes us feel a little bit better about how huge it is. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be much less imposing if it was on the ground, wouldn't it? In the sort of 70s style. Yeah, in the 70s style. We, we have tried using them on the ground, but they sound so much better on the stands. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed that they sound, they sound really good generally, yeah. but they sound much better than most loudspeakers at lower levels when they're being played relatively quietly. Is this because of the high sensitivity or is it because of the large drive I think units? It's, I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a multitude of factors. Um, certainly the high sensitivity, it's, it's 96 dB for 2.83 volts. That helps. Sure. Because it means nothing in the downstream side, the amplifier's not being hardly driven at all. No. no. That certainly helps. Um, Other than that, yes, the big the, the, the big cone area is is a significant. I mean, that that the, the really big cone area dominates all of its characteristics. Mm. Really, that's mm. that's why that's fundamentally why it sounds the way it does, mm. is that it's got such reserves of cone area, so the drivers don't have to move at all. And does that mean because there's, the trend has been away from that, hasn't it? For the last fifty years, people have been yeah. making smaller and smaller bass drivers and, and, and mid ranges. And, and I I read a review. <clears throat> On your site, but the sensitivity was eighty two point five. Yeah, yeah. And even though the engineering and the speaker is is fabulous, and the electric electroacoustics is really clever. If you're having to pour that much power into a speaker to get any sound out of it, your levels of thermal compression are going to be huge. Right. right. I mean, that's another thing about about sensitivity of that. The degree that we've got with the, with the fifteen twelve is, is there's, there's no thermal compression. So thermal compression is within the the motor system. Yeah, within the motor system, as the voice coil heats up, its right. resistance rises. Right. Okay. And it's that's another. Drops. So that's another factor in, yeah, it's another in its factor. favour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's always been the case with with high sensitivity loudspeakers, but there's with all loudspeakers, there's a fundamental trade off of sensitivity versus box volume versus low frequency extension. Right. Mm. With the fifteen twelve, we've we've basically said right, let's let's not bother about the box volume. It'll be as big as it needs to mm. be. Mm. Um, then tell people it's the chest of drawers. <laughs> <laughs> what so, is, it? is it about one hundred and fifty liters? Something like that. The total is about two hundred and fifty. Wow. Um, right. And the mid range driver is in its own is in own own separate is enclosure with right, enclosure, right. and that's about I think it's twenty five. I can't really remember. Right, so it's about two two five. Um, for the two bass drivers. Right, that's pretty decent, isn't it? Back to your question about sounding good at low levels. I think I think loudspeakers sound good at the fundament, at any level if the fundamental electroacoustics is well sorted. Right. And that's kind of what we try we try to do with with, with the fifteen twelve is it's a properly engineered electroacoustic solution. Um, and we like to concentrate on 
on the engineering they like to talk about the genuine engineering and the, and the genuine electroacoustics i'm i'm a, a I've been in the speaker business since the 1980s and I, and I still love it. I still love the problems that it throws up. Right, right. Um, and I think sometimes the, the high-end hi-fi world gets too easily diverted into, into snake oil and discussions of sounds of components and sounds of cables when actually the fundamentals are more important. Yeah. And what yeah. we're demonstrating here with the 1512 is a fundamental aspect of speaker design but if you have lots of cone area the cone has to move less therefore the distortion products are much lower and this is the result you get yeah well this it seems to make a good a very good case for that that's for sure I mean, i've had a lot of expensive loudspeakers in here yeah, yeah. not usually as wide as this but <laughs> similar <laughs> sort of, similar sort of volume i yeah. would say and uh, this is definitely amongst the very best that's for sure and the easiest to drive, yeah. which is clearly... That's another thing we wanted. We wanted, we wanted a, a speaker that literally could be driven by any amplifier. Right. So not only is it 96 dB, its impedance doesn't drop below 8 ohms. Really? Well, its that's phase fantastic. angle doesn't, doesn't exceed 20 degrees. Mm. Um, above, I'm, I'm talking above 100 hertz, because obviously at the bottom end, it's got the, re the uh, reflex peaks in its impedance. Right. But above that, it's almost resistive. Right. So it's very, very easy to drive. And I see you put in um, output controls for the mid and high frequency. Is that because that's what they had on the original Pro monitors? Partly they had, the, the, partly the JBL had that. It had some little EQ tweaks. But also, we very much appreciate that this speaker is going to be used in all sorts of different size listening rooms from very small and, and dead to very large and reverberant. Mm. So the idea that you can tweak the balance a bit to suit the room. Right. Also, right. tweaking the balance by moving the speaker is much more difficult when the speaker weighs 140 kilograms. Well, presumably, you do other finishes. Yes, one of the one of the um, principles behind the thing is is that at the top end of the available model range, you can have almost any finish you like. We have a we have a supply chain that can do an enormous amount of different finishes on the right. enclosure. Right. Um, so. If somebody wanted custom made, they can have anything they like. Really, got you. In the middle, in the middle of the of the, of the range of the fifteen twelve, we we're offering sort of the standard range of veneers. Right. What? So which veneer is this? This is olive. Olive. Oh, right. That's mm -hmm. very nice. Isn't and it? different colours from the acrylic because the, right. the acrylic is self colour, so it comes, yeah, yeah, it can come in a huge range of colours. Mm -hmm. And you've got a particularly deep um, wave guide on the tweeter. Is that to sort of try and increase the efficiency? It that? increases the efficiency and controls the dispersion. Right. Um, one of the issues, obviously, with, with such a big mid-range mid driver is its dispersion narrows quite quickly at the top of its range. So we try to match dispersion okay. through the crossover region by using a waveguide. Right, right. I see more and more of that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a technique. Mm. Perhaps not so much in high fail, although Amphion are very noticeable. Yeah, there's a, there are a few. Yeah, there's a few, people. but it's quite common. You seem to get grow. both schools yeah. of thought, in fact, yeah. don't you? You get the, the sort of maximum dispersion yeah. school and the control. But the also, it's it's the the sensitivity boost, especially at the bottom end of the tweeter, that we get from the waveguide is really useful. Right. right. Yeah. Um, well, so, what? so the sensitive, sensitivity of the tweeter with. Um, at the bottom end of its range with the waveguide is I think about 101 dB. Wow, that's pretty good, isn't it? But we, yeah. we, we need that because we don't want to have to we don't want to be driving the tweeter too hard. Yeah. Because obviously these the the, the mid-range drive and the base drivers will go very loud. The, the tweeter in this sort of system is always going to be the limiting factor. So we, presumably the notion of an active version has crossed your mind. Oh we've talked about it a lot, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess it would make it immovably heavy though, wouldn't it? That's, uh, well, one, no, one class problem. D, class no, D, no, class no, that's high decks or you know, very high quality class D would be really interesting. It would, wouldn't it? Um, so well, you could have an external yeah. amplifier. Yeah, if somebody, something. if somebody asked us to do it, we'd do it. <laughs> yeah. That'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of passive crossovers from an engineering point of view because I love tinkering with them. I love, right, right. I love, the, I love the art of voicing a speaker with a passive crossover. Right. We work really hard on the choice of these, these drive units to get drive units with the characteristics that we really wanted. Mm. If it had been inactive from the start, we probably would have said, oh, 
it doesn't really matter on the drivers, we can EQ that flat. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Yeah. And there's a purity, I think, in, yeah. in the passive world that maybe yeah. the active world doesn't have.